Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm a partner at Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm, and I'm also the managing director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, the next of which we're excited to host in Singapore, November 14th to the 16th at Marina Bay Sands. But our goal at those events and our goal on these talks is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to bring you a discussion about one of those big ideas that we like to feature a lot on Salt Talks. And that's what's going on in the digital asset blockchain space. And we're Excited to bring you the latest episode of the Salt Crypto Show. Our guest today is Dave Ripley. Uh, David Ripley is the incoming chief executive officer at Kraken, which is a global digital asset exchange. And just to have to disclose before we get into the conversation, on the Skybridge side of the house, we are proud and active investors in Kraken. Uh, so ex excited to see Dave uh, continue to work with Jesse uh, to continue to elevate Kraken uh, into one of the leading digital asset exchanges in the marketplace. But before becoming Kraken's incoming CEO, Dave served as the chief operating officer at Kraken for over six years, playing an instrumental role in growing the company to be one of the largest crypto exchanges in the world. Under his guidance as COO, Kraken completed 16 acquisitions and secured a significant number of partnerships and regulatory licenses to scale the business. Before joining Kraken, Dave was the CEO and co-founder of Gladera, which is an award-winning non-custodial wallet and funding service provider, which was acquired by Kraken in 2016. Before coming to crypto, Dave spent more than a decade in product development and consultancy, advising Fortune 500 executives on strategic priorities across multiple industries. He holds a master's in business administration from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern and a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois. Dave, uh, it's great to have you on first. I wanna say congratulations again on your soon to be role as Kraken CEO. You've been at the company for a while, so you're not new uh, to Kraken. You've been you've been CEO for six years, as I mentioned in the open. Could you tell us a little bit more about your time at Kraken and more broadly about your personal journey into crypto? Yeah, sure, thanks for having me on, John. Uh, yeah, happy to, happy to talk about really the last decade of my life, uh, which has been really all, all encompassing with crypto, truthfully. I, um, so I guess it was about nine years ago in uh, 2013. Um, yeah, I was at uh, BCG, Boston Consulting Group, as you mentioned at the time. And I was, I was actually um, looking for, you know, new opportunities outside. I was in the tech industry before. I kind of always had in the back of my mind um, about founding a company at some point. And that was, you know, kind of shaken out to be like a, you know, a likely potential path for myself. And um, an individual introduced me to the Bitcoin white paper, of course, kind of a similar story now to many people that, that first, you know, get into Bitcoin crypto. Um, and, you know, I, I did the, I did the rabbit hole, which, you know, again, it, it sounds almost cliche at this point in time. Uh, but, you know, I spent really, it was months uh, learning about crypto from Bitcoin at the time, what we refer to it as um, from every angle, um, you know, kind of like a, um, closet hobbyist, macro econo economist, um, har far from a professional, but it, it's definitely a hobby of mine. And so the economic angle, angle, of course, the technology angle, given I was an engineer, um, you know, society, government, all these other different pieces, just came really, really interested in it. And um, as I mentioned, I was looking to potentially found a company and you actually couldn't do anything else in crypto at the time other than found a company, there wasn't really any companies to go work for. And so that that's what I, we did. Uh, founded a company, you know, uh, fast forward a few years, Kraken was one of our partners. We did the acquisition. Um, Kraken was a small company at the time, uh, less than 100 people. Um, I don't really remember the headcount exactly, probably, like I said, 50-ish, less than 100. So um, a small, smallish company at the time itself. Um, and uh, and yeah, we've uh, you know we've certainly you know certainly grown since that time frame. We're about thirty four hundred now, um, so definitely a, a different company from 
uh, you know, kind of in terms of scale and all those different pieces. And so definitely been quite a journey. If you were giving the elevator pitch to somebody who didn't discover Bitcoin as early as you and is still learning about crypto and trying to figure out you know, its real value to the world, what would that pitch be about why blockchain technology, why, why cryptocurrencies, why they are here to stay and they're going to transform the way the internet works and, and the way our society works? Yeah, well, you know, I would, you know, whether this is the right way to start with, uh, you know, someone new to crypto or not, I couldn't help myself but to start with like what, you know, crypto really does from and what our, our mission is based on, which is all about economic freedom, independence, uh, financial inclusion. And so, you know, we see crypto as something where, you know, it is that open network that welcomes all, um, that gives everyone an ability to, you know, own their own um you know, financial assets, own their own, um, you know, soon to be identity and a number of these different things and really gives individuals that autonomy that, uh, you know, frankly, you don't have with, uh, you know, traditional financial services with trusted third parties um, across many different parts of, uh, you know, um, your life, really, um, you know, from communication to financial services and all those pieces. So I, you know, I would start at the you know the the highest level and what really drives my my interest. Um, you know, but breaking it down, I think that like means a lot of different things. Uh, you know, more tangibly and functionally, right? It means that you know uh, you you can kind of transact more um, you know freely from a global standpoint, um, which is really meaningful. Um, faster, lower cost, all of these different pieces. Um, and frankly, given that it's, you know, basically programmable uh, money, um, just the, the number of different applications that are, you know, starting to arise in use cases are, are incredibly interesting as well. You talked about you began your journey with the Bitcoin white paper, like a lot of people in crypto today. Uh, and Kraken itself has evolved over the years as well. It started as a Bitcoin exchange, basically. And today it's a very diverse crypto platform uh, with a lot of different functions. And one of the things I can speak with my Skybridge hat on for a second is the size of, for example, your staking business is massive. And it's a, it's an industry leading business that, that continues to grow. Could you tell us a little bit more about where Kraken is today, all the different uh, suite of services that you provide to customers and what the strategic plan in terms of how you want to differentiate yourself within the marketplace? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So like, I mean, I, I could just kind of like try and race through like a little bit of, you know, what, what brought, and brought Kraken to where we're at today. I mean, we started um, the first exchange in, in Europe, you know, the first place in the world where you can buy and sell Bitcoin with euros. Um, so we're an exchange, but really the way we thought about the business and have thought about the business is we're a bridge, you know, we're a bridge from, you know, where a lot of people are at today, traditional financial services, fiat and into crypto. Um, and so we've kind of like uh, added on to that bridge uh, over time, and we've done we've had a lot of firsts. We've you know you know we were one of the first to go uh, multi-token beyond just Bitcoin, uh, one of the first to offer margin. We kind of have a, a heritage also in um, working with you know more of the like the pro trader uh, community, professional traders uh, as well. Um, we we're one of the first to. Uh, uh, list Ethereum, early to derivatives, and, and on down the line. And so what we're really interested in doing going forward is taking that bridge and building that bridge deeper and deeper into like the crypto ecosystem. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's not, you know, we're no longer a way just to, you know, buy your first Bitcoin, but um, we're looking to actually bring some of those most exciting use cases and make them really accessible for, for individuals. And so you mentioned one staking, uh, we think, you know, we kind of, I would say we got out, you know, relatively early there um, and went maybe more aggressive with uh, supporting a number of different of the most interesting technologies and so forth. And so that's been a, a fantastic success for us. Um, and we think, um, you know, something that's going to continue to be a success for us going forward. And then, you know, as you think about a lot of the new different use cases out there, we're, we're frankly interested in a lot of those crypto uh, use cases, whether it's DeFi, NFTs, or, 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 or the next, you know, next, you know, five, 10 interesting use cases that will come about. We're interested in kind of, like I said, building that bridge into those use cases, making them more accessible for, for, our, for our clients. 
you've been in crypto long enough that you've experienced a couple of bear markets. Uh, certainly we're in one right now, but the bear market that we're in right now isn't necessarily exclusive to crypto. Uh, we're in unprecedented economic times where you see the one-year performance of Bitcoin is actually better than the one-year performance of uh, UK long bonds. Um, so certainly we're seeing all types of different dislocations. But does this downturn feel any different to you than other crypto bear markets that we've been in? Uh, or is there something that that feels different this time? Yeah, so um, you know, there's probably two ways to answer that question. One, like personally, and then two, you know, from a market standpoint. Um, so I'll do the personal one first. Like, yeah, I, I did just kind of like, as I, I told that, that crypto journey pretty quickly, I did gloss over the, the bear market, um, uh, you know, bear market dynamic that we had to deal with across time. And I'll tell you the first one, 2015, I was like, oh, dear God, what have I done with my life? Like, it was it was quite challenging um, uh, getting through that first first bear market. And the second one, you know, still challenging, but not quite as tough. And, you know, this one, I think we're, I'm personally coming into this one. I'm like, let's fucking go. Let's do this. <laughs> like, we know, we know how to do this. We've been there before. You know, it's not our first rodeo. We're prepared for this one. We're coming off a great, great year financially, balance sheet, all those kinds of things. So um, that's kind of my personal take on them. I, you know, I don't know as far as like the broader market. It is. You're right. I mean, this is there is a kind of a, a different macro environment this time than what we've seen the past couple. Um, the last time we we saw you know kind of like a broader global recessionary type environment was. 2008 and you know when the the bitcoin wake paper was released on the heels of that um and so it'll be interesting to see how bitcoin performs honestly i i i continue to be optimistic because i think you know bitcoin has developed this correlation with risk on assets more recently um but i think you know it's it's use case as an inflation hedge is still it still has a a very meaningful role to play, and it can play that role and will play that role over the long arc. Um, and so I think, you know, whether the environment is inflationary or not, um, I, I think there's, you know, there's there's opportunity for, you know, Bitcoin and crypto to perform well. And fiat currencies are obviously a, a relative game. And so despite the United States and some of the dysfunction that we have in our own country, high inflation, running massive deficits, a uh, $31 trillion national debt at this point. Our house is much in much better order than the houses in Japan and Europe and other parts of the world. And so as a result, the strong dollar is, is wreaking havoc. Um, do you think that there could be that decoupling that you mentioned? Or, or let me frame the question differently. When do you expect the crypto spring to come? Is it going to be a shift in macroeconomic uh, the sh shift in the macroeconomic landscape, or is it going to be because of a realization that Bitcoin provides an alternative to the fiat-based system and, and more people, especially in emerging markets that are getting wrecked uh, in their local currencies, start to realize that? What do you think is going to be the impetus for a sort of a rebound in, in uh, crypto markets generally? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, so so I think the answer, and I'll come back to this in a minute, it's around use cases, actually. Um and but you know on this on this kind of like relative global fiat uh, cr currency game, yeah, it's interesting, right? I mean, you know, a lot of these you know various different domestic global currencies and how they're performing versus the dollar is interesting, and that I mean, I think that's what we're going to be looking at as far as you know Bitcoin actually being a benchmark at some point in time. Of course, we're you know quite volatile now, and we're risk on and all these different pieces, but as you know, adoption grows and use cases grow and we begin to, um, you know, have more and more usage for commerce and so forth. I think it, it's actually going to be that benchmark with a deterministic money supply that um, will will behave um, meaningfully differently with than all of these other fiat, you know, all of these fiat currencies that, that don't have a deterministic supply. Um, yeah. What what do you think the biggest impediment to broader crypto adoption is? You know, there's there's a, a stigma among some people that crypto is this magic internet money with no real use case and 
and they see the young people with the have fun staying poor and and all that type of stuff. And then there's also regulatory issues. There's there's various things. Um, what, in your view, is the biggest hurdle to broader adoption at this point? Yeah. Well, you know, I think it it, it turns out it's pretty pretty difficult to like launch and build a new currency globally without like a government to to guide it and do all those things. Um, this isn't easy. Um, but the points we you know we as a community have put on the board are, are pretty incredible and impressive. Um, what is it going to take? It's going to take use cases, right? I mean, it's got to be useful for individuals, um, for sure. And I mean, th- this is this is a big piece. And so, like, I mean, we take what, and there are impediments, right, for the for these things that happen. Like, let's take, you know, global uh, global payments, global transfers, remittances, and the like. Um, I mean, it, you know. It, Bitcoin and crypto's value for, you know, global payments, global transfers is like clear, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, friction and cost and all these pieces. But it actually only becomes, um, you know, so it's maybe somewhat better now, but it really only becomes 10x better, which is what we actually need. I mean, we need, you know, we need 10x better um, for that particular use case. Once you have all of the infrastructure built out, once you have you know, crypto in the hands of everyone and they have wallets and they have, you know, mechanisms to actually use it, whether it's exchanged locally or, or pay for things with, with Bitcoin and so forth. And once you get there, um, then the use case becomes like really powerful. So, but we have this, you know, kind of catch 22. So we're, we're building out all of this infrastructure. I mean, it's significant, the, you know, what, what actually is entailed in, in, in doing that and getting crypto in everyone's hands and so forth. So, um, and doing it in a distributed way globally. So, you know, it's going to take take time, but like looking for these 10X use cases, I mean, there's going to be more out there than just that one. Some of them might even be easier, but maybe a lot smaller. So like, let's take NFTs. Like, you know, I collected baseball cards growing up and, you know, the fact that, you know, there's now like a digital baseball card that's actually probably better in a lot of ways, it may be 10x better than that little like little piece of cardboard that I, I had and cherished for whatever reason. Um, and you know, that's the, you know, a number of these different use cases with NFTs are are, are actually pretty interesting. And you you just couldn't, you know, they, these didn't exist before. And so there's there's opportunities for you know 10x um, you know, with both big and small use cases, I think, in crypto. Let's talk about security. So I think over the last six months, uh, at least as the space has grown, the hacks that have taken place on both decentralized uh, exchanges and and through different token bridges and things like that have gotten bigger and gotten high profile. And as you talk to people that are crypto skeptics, I think some will use that as ammunition to say, look, this system, this decentralized permissionless system doesn't have the same checks and balances in place to keep you safe as the traditional banking system, for example. What's your view on security? How does the industry need to improve from a security perspective to make people feel more comfortable transacting, holding, using crypto? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it is. I mean, this is this is one of the things. Not only do we have to build these 10x use cases, but they also need to be secure and they need to be easy to use. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, security is is significant. This is, you know, our, uh, you know, one of the, the, the Kraken co-founder, uh, co-founder CTO um, often refers to Kraken as uh, a security company with an exchange built on top. So, you know, we take this stuff like incredibly seriously, um, you know, more so than any other part of our business. A huge security team, an incredibly fantastic chief security officer, all the all these different pieces, and, and frankly, a security mindset across the business. Um, little plug for cracking there, I guess. But like the, uh, you know, broader in the industry, yeah, I mean, th- there there are some that are happening, um, you know, of course not on Bitcoin, but some of them that are happening more at like the network level, um, layer two level, and then up from there. Of course, you see, you know, we've seen exchange hacks, we've seen wallet hacks um, over the years. And so, you know, I think it, it really is some, you know, a part of crypto that, has a promise of being like incredibly secure, but you know, investing in this area of you know cybersecurity, in particular as it relates to crypto, 
is really important, um, you know, across all, all levels of the stack. And I, I think it'll, it'll, you know, inhibit, inhibit growth. If, you know, if we don't take that seriously, we as, as a community, uh, uh, you know, participants in crypto. So we did a survey, we hosted a, a digital assets conference in April in the Bahamas. We did a survey among institutions that were in attendance. And there were a lot of traditional hedge funds that either have very small exposure to the space or or uh, wanting to learn more about the space before jumping in deeper. And, and we did a poll about what the biggest obstacle for them to investing in the space was. The overwhelming uh, most popular answer was around regulation. Mm. So Kraken has built out a significant policy team, has spent time in Washington over the last year, year and a half, uh, become more active engaging with lawmakers and regulators. How are you guys navigating those murky waters uh, of regulation what are your predictions on where crypto regulation might land in the short term? And then where do you think it should land? So to, two parts to that question. Where will it land? Where where do you think it should land in terms of how uh, digital assets are regulated? Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. Yeah. Like, so how are we navigating it? For sure, it's, you know, investing heavily in that area. We got, you know, 300 in our kind of like core compliance, another 300 in compliance ops, 50 plus in the legal team policy, like you said. So we're kind of getting out there working with regulators, you know, a dozen plus licenses and registrations at this point in time. So quite significant. Um, I mean, where do we think it'll land? Like, where do, I mean, I, I think, uh, let me answer like the second one first, which is where do we want it to land? So like, you know, we think that like some of the, the kind of like core um, aspects of, of crypto, um, you know, I mean, they just should be untouched because, you know, this is this is, in fact, how, um, you know, most of the world lives, which is like, look, open source software, the ability to publish it, um, you know, publish it, run it, um, you know, have a wallet on your your own device, all of these types of things and do these things autonomously. Um, th those should I mean, th these these are you know, these are just kind of like core freedoms. Right. That that absolutely should be should be untouched. Um, you move over to a um, you know a, a kind of like a centralized custodial player like Kraken. Okay, we, we, you know we need to you know we there's there is regulation as I just got done saying like you know there's absolutely a number of things that we're doing to kind of move into the regulatory fold. We think it could you know there's better ways to do it versus versus not. You know there's a number of regulations that. Um, Need to be cognizant of um, you know what crypto is. It's in, it, both its advantages and drawbacks. So I think um, you know I think that's where we hope hope to see things go. Is like yes, the trusted third party is much the same as they exist in traditional financial services. You know there there should be regulation there because you know there there isn't you know the ability to. Um, you know, kind of do things autonomously when when you're talking about a trusted third party. Are you encouraged by the current discourse in Washington around digital asset regulation? You know, there's a lot of different. There's sort of a uh, a land grab with the SEC and the CFTC right now. There's been some regulation by enforcement in different cases without you know, ever really establishing the guardrails here. I think we yeah. all agree that there needs to be regulation because people need to know what's right and what's wrong, and we need to offer protection to uh, you know, people who have might have been uh, taken advantage of in some of these, whether it be hacks or um, mismanaged treasuries at some of these centralized entities as a result of a lack of oversight. But are you encouraged with the dialogue or are you are you still a little bit uh, pessimistic or nervous around the direction uh, that some of our regulatory leadership wants to take? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's mixed. I, maybe it's always always been mixed. I, you know, I think there's, you know, there's, um, you know, a lot of different ways things could go. Um, I, you know, I mean, obviously, like, like a classic example was like New York's initial bit license, which, you know, was really went in the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think, I think most, uh, you know, frankly, almost everything has improved <laughs> since that, that point in time. Um, you know, yeah, like regulation by enforcement, you know, that, um, that's an interesting one, how that dynamic ensues. 
um, and why that why that actually exists is a little bit difficult to little bit difficult to tell. Um, why there you know isn't you know kind of a willingness to you know engage in in clarity. I mean, we've developed um, you know in depth uh, frameworks to assess you know whether a token is a security or not. Deploying all those legal and compliance resources. Um, in a meaningful way to do those assessments and, you know, kind of any anything that may even, you know, look or act like a security. And so we've done a lot of this and, you know, the, you know, as much guidance that exists out there is, you know, just kind of in line with, you know, laws that were, you know, written back in the 30s and, um, you know, earlier part of the, the 20th century. Um, yeah. And, uh I don't think a lot that. of which are very subjective, by the way. You know, the uh, there, there's the Howey test, which is used in a lot of cases. And, you know, the, the next question I had for you was around NFTs, which is sort of timely around both regulation and NFTs, is that, you know, that there's uh, currently Board Ape Yacht Club, Yuga Labs is uh, being investigated about whether they were involved in, in uh, an illegal security sale, things of that nature. But um, the, the broader question is around NFTs, which is, you know, Crypto, in my mind, is partly a technology revolution, it's partly a financial revolution, and it's partly a cultural revolution. And as yeah. you said, as a, as a baseball card collector, um, you were involved in something for, for a long period of time that the people have been enthusiastic about. But now you have this really fervent uh, community around NFT collecting and whether that be PFPs or whether it be photography or whether it be um, different types of art. I know Kraken is is getting into the space and wanting to launch an NFT marketplace. Could you talk about why you guys feel strongly about wanting to offer an NFT marketplace and what you see as the long term future for NFTs? Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, kind of like I mentioned before, we're looking to build this bridge into all the different interesting use cases. Um, we think we got an interesting take on our our new NFT marketplace where. Um, going to be like leveraging a lot of kind of like our existing Kraken infrastructure, the Kraken client account, the ability to, um, you know, buy and sell NFTs with eight different fiat currencies and all the 200 different cryptocurrencies and so forth. So super excited about getting into the, getting in the space with a, you know, an imminent launch this quarter um, for the product. We think, I mean, honestly, I think there, you know, NFT, of course, NFT isn't a use case. It's just non-fungible token, right? It's a technology, right. just, the, just the same as, uh, you know, we basically have you know, fungible or non-fungible. And if, frankly, neither of them by themselves are, are a use case. Um, and so, uh, but there are a lot of use cases that we see that are going to be built uh, using NFT. Some of the most basic, simple ones are at Rose First collectibles, frankly, because they were the easiest to build. and um, they kind of fit with the reality of the network, which were the uh, network fees and um, you know that existed and so forth. And so um, many of these other use cases that are more complex, you know, virtual worlds and game five, we're scratching the surface there as well with NFTs. But they're they're going to you know some of those to be you know will require being you know built out more more so over time, um, you know, uh, social you know. Uh, Kind of like a decentralized social media could you know, probably leverage both you know fungible and non fungible tokens and so forth and so I think there's going to be a huge amount of innovation in in and around that space and uh, I think uh, you know it's important for Kraken to be part of it. Yeah, we do our salt conferences around the world. So we we have one in New York, we have one in Abu Dhabi, which I know Kraken is is one of the few exchanges licensed at ADGM uh, in, in Abu Dhabi as an exchange in the Middle East. We also have a SALT conference in Singapore, which is our next one. And both uh, at Tomasic, uh, one of the sovereign wealth funds in Singapore, and at uh, the sovereign wealth funds in Abu Dhabi, there is a keen interest in the metaverse and everything that that entails. And like you said, I think NFTs are viewed, yes, the, the collectibles uh, side of NFTs is obviously has a significant market, but uh, I think there's keen interest from the, the largest institutional investors in the world around the metaverse and all the different applications for NFTs. Like you said, uh, it's a very broad uh, asset that it can be used in a lot of different ways and the utility can be applied in a lot of different ways. Um, I want to talk about uh, IPOs. So we're not exactly in the type of market environment where you see a lot of IPOs. You know, we are uh, significant investors in a lot of private fintech companies, both digital assets 
and non. And so, you know, we're keenly interested in in the environment for IPOs and the way companies are thinking about it. Kraken is a fairly mature company in the space. Um, and there's been speculation about potential IPOs, you know, when market conditions are right, potentially. What factors will eventually go into that decision for Kraken about whether you want to go public, when that might be, and the pros and cons of being a public company in a industry that still remains somewhat unregulated? No. Yeah. So, you know, of course, a, a tough one to, you know, share too much, too much on. Um, but, you know, just if you look at, um, you know, just generally, you know, fundraising and public markets, one of the things that we've done historically is a lot of our, um, a lot of our kind of clients, early clients have been our early investors as well. And that's been like a good partnership. Um, some, just some great, um, uh, you know, yeah, just a great partnership over time. We've tried to add to that. I mean, Scott Bridge being, being one of them as well, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the, you know, accessing public markets would be like a way to, you know, do that, you know, 10 times over, or, you know, thousands of times over. So that's like some that's interesting out there. That said, you know, I mean, of course, there's, there's a number of, you know, different things that, you know, need to happen for, you know, Kraken to, to be public. Truthfully, you know, with all the things that we do on the, the regulatory side, we're already doing a lot, right, with regard to like audits and, um, um, a lot of reporting and so forth. And so, you know, a lot of that infrastructure where, you know, where we have, you know, been building out like irrespective of, of an IPO. So, um, you know, I mean, from a timing standpoint, not really, not really anything like, you know, specific on that front, but, you know, it's, it's certainly an opportunity out there just the same as kind of like continued access of, of private markets as well. Very good answer. You, you at least gave me something and, and you've probably been coached on that answer a few times, but I appreciate yeah. it, Andrew. Yeah, we'll um, see how, how, how they say I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are you most excited about in crypto? You know, so I think as I talk to a lot of crypto investors and crypto builders, I think a lot of the true believers relish environments like this, environments where a lot of the froth, a lot of the uh, tourists in the space are gone or at least, you know, back at their their true homes. Um, and now you have the people that are really keen on building that have their heads down and, and working on those next, you know, 10x, 100x use cases. Um, what are you most excited about in the crypto space over the next five or 10 years? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a little bit of a balance because I mean, you're right. I mean, there is there is something to be said for, you know, those that are really, you know, here building. I mean, certainly, you know, folks that are you know, not actually seriously, you know, looking to build and further the ecosystem are, you know, well, I mean, they're fine. But I mean, I, I think we're very much interested in, in those that are really looking to, to, you know, to do something special in the space. I think, I mean, I've talked to maybe a decent amount about use cases and I'll say like, I'll take like another lens on it, um, which is what I what I'm most excited about from uh, when I talk about various different use cases. So, like by way of analogy, you kind of have like the internet in the early days. Of the internet you'd have um, you know a number of different use cases, and so an example is like e-commerce, email, online media, and they were all like more powerful because the other ones existed. Right. And so e-commerce was so much better because email was there and you could email back and forth with customer support. Um, and you could view your merchandise online with, you know, online, online media or whatever. Um, I think we're, 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 we're on the cost of starting to see this happen in crypto where we have like reinforcing use cases um, in the coming, you know, five years. Um, so, you know, crypto, you know, an example might be, Hey, you have uh, an NFT for you know some digital art. That digital art is you know valuable, hundred thousand um, dollars. You know that it's it's traded for, and you can now use it as collateral in a DeFi contract. And once we start, I think seeing these reinforcing use cases, I think this is where we hit escape velocity uh, in crypto, and things really really start to take off. Well, Dave, it was a pleasure to have you on Salt Talks. Again, excited to uh, meet you and, and learn more about you as you take the reins uh, as CEO of Kraken again with uh, Kraken's founder, Jesse Powell, still being heavily involved, but 
really excited for the future of the company. Again, as we performed our due diligence, again, putting my Skybridge hat on as opposed to my salt hat, uh, we're, we're very enthusiastic investors and, and excited for the future. So thanks for coming on. We hope to see you in person at one of our future SALT events and uh, and look forward to, to staying in touch. No, sounds great. Thanks so much, John. Really appreciate talking to you today. Thanks again, Dave. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to today's SALT Talk with Dave Ripley, the incoming CEO of Kraken. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this episode or any of our previous episodes, you can access them on our website at salt.org backslash talks, on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Tube, or anywhere that you consume podcasts, you can listen to this in audio form. Uh, we're on social media. Twitter is where we're most active at Salt Conference, but we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as well. And please spread the word about these Salt Talks. We love educating people that are both new and old to the uh, cryptocurrency digital asset market. Uh, and so please tell your skeptical uncle about this talk and hopefully he'll learn something. But on behalf of the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off for today. We hope to see you back here again soon.